Jesus called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. The Bible contains remarkable stories of miracles and divine interventions. Moses parted the sea. Peter healed a man lame from his mother's womb. Jesus drove demons out of people and raised others from the dead. But are these types of events still happening today? We too have a beam of divine light and guidance that God has put within the heart of every man. And it's one of the greatest proofs that there is a God. More amazing supernatural things are happening than we realize. This is Divine Intervention, the interview show that features intriguing people who've experienced the hand of God in amazing ways. Divine Intervention was created and produced with the purpose of encouraging believers, spiritual seekers, and skeptics alike that Jesus is alive and is still performing miracles and working in the world today. I believe in miracles. Here's your host, Daniel Fazina. Hello and welcome to Divine Intervention Radio, the interview show that features intriguing people who've experienced the hand of God in amazing ways. I am your host, Daniel Fazina. So honored, privileged, and excited to be here with you today. Got another amazing guest in store with a powerful testimony. So we're going to get to our special guest in a minute, but before we do that, I just want to remind you, as always, if you miss any of these shows, they're all archived on divineinterventionradio.com. Go to the website there, divineinterventionradio.com. You can listen at your leisure, and you can share the podcasts with your friends. Uh, They're all up on YouTube there. You can check us out on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Divine Intervention Radio. And also, you can follow me on Twitter at Daniel Fazina, the numeral one, at Daniel Fazina one on twitter.com. And of course, drop me a line. If you want to email me, I'd love to hear how this show has impacted you or encouraged you in any way. Divineintervention at mail.com is the email address, divineintervention at mail.com. Also, friend, I have a request. I need a favor from you. If you're listening to this broadcast between October 28th and November 24th, 2015, I need a huge favor from you. I've entered my young daughter, Evangeline, into the Gerber Baby 2015 photo search competition. They're looking for a spokesbaby for 2016. So I submitted a photograph of my 11-month-old daughter, Evangeline. The judges are going to pick the grand prize winner, but there are milestone awards for, you know, toddler and sitter and birth, crawler, that kind of thing. And those are determined by popular vote. So I'm requesting your help in overwhelming Gerber servers with the love of the cuteness. (laughs) So if you wouldn't mind, please go to Gerber.com, click on the Gerber Baby 2015 photo search button there, and uh, you can register your email, and then you can vote for my Evangeline Hope. That would be so awesome. I would really appreciate your help. She is baby number 286048. Once again, 286048. Her name is Evangeline. And you can do a search there. And then uh, share the cuteness. You can share it to Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And, you know, get your friends to vote for her, too. I would really appreciate that. Again, the contest is from October 28th to November 24th, 2015. So if you're listening to this broadcast within that time frame, please go to Gerber.com, register, and vote for Evangeline. Baby number 286048 from Henrico, Virginia. That's 286048. And you can see the parent's name there is Daniel. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your help with this. Winners will be announced in January of 2016, and I will definitely let you know what happens with that. All right, friend, thank you so much. And now I want to get to our special guest. It is an amazing story of divine protection. My special guest today is Mr. Dale Wells from South Carolina. He's got a background in restaurant management, and uh, his life changed dramatically. One day when he was a victim of domestic violence and attempted murder, He was shot not once, not twice, not three times, five times at point-blank range with a three fifty seven Magnum revolver. And for those of you who don't know, that is not a small caliber bullet. That is a very powerful handgun. Most people don't survive even one shot from that. Uh, But our guest today defied the odds by God's grace, and he is here to share his riveting story. You're not going to want to miss this one, so sit back as I introduce to you Mr. Dale Wells right now on Divine Intervention Radio. Dale, welcome to Divine Intervention Radio. It's so good to have you. Thanks for joining us. 
It is my pleasure. It's a privilege and honor to be here, and I thank you very, very much. Well, you are welcome. And, you know, when I was first told about you from my good friend Eric Musser over at CBN, and he told me the amazing journey that you had and the uh, situation where God really protected you and brought you through, I really wanted to get this story on divine intervention to share with our listeners because I know it's really going to encourage people. Uh, but before we get to your traumatic incident, uh, why don't you take us to the beginning? Tell us a little bit about your background growing up and your faith journey. All right. Well, my name is Dale. I'm born and raised in Canton, Ohio, Pro Football Hall of Fame. I um, received the full scholarship to Wright State University wow. in Dayton, Ohio. My parents were pastors, so I was a pastor's kid. And... I'm a mother's first lady, so I was raised in the church. Okay. Uh, always had a faith background. We typical went to church Saturday, Sunday, Wednesday, Friday. But just because you're in the church doesn't mean that the church is in you. Right. Um, but I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior fully in 1987. Okay. I always like to uh, make the analogy that... Uh, you know, going to church makes you a Christian just as much as standing in a garage makes you a car. <laughs> okay, exactly. Wow, that's good. Yeah. Exactly. You might know and hear and know all the scriptures and, and, and whatnot from memory that you're taught in Sunday school and Bible study. And, and um, But until you accept the Lord as your personal Savior, then... Like you said, you're just a car in a garage. <laughs> All right. So you were, how old were you when you accepted the Lord then? 1987, uh, due to math, about 26. 26, okay. All right. What was it that at that time made you want to give your life to the Lord? I've always had, I've uh, been prophesied that there's always been something destined in my life and okay. from a young age satan was busy in my in our family at, at trying to destroy me i remember one time i was in my home and my dad i have three sisters three brothers we lived in a three-story home uh and my dad needed an extension cord so I said I knew where one was, so I ran down to the basement, and that's where we had our washer and dryer hooked up, and the washing machine was hooked up, um, but it was plugged into the same outlet to where this extension cord was. But our washing machine leaked a little bit of water, so I'm standing in a puddle of water, and I'm reaching above my head to unplug the extension cord from oh, the intercom system that my dad had set up in the house. That's not a good but, situation. <laughs> <laughs> right, I, and I didn't have the strength to pull it apart, and so not thinking, as a child, I must have been eight or nine, I pulled it down to my mouth, and I'm biting on it, oh my gosh. trying to pull it apart, and the electricity went through my body. I mean, I know you've seen a cartoon where you see when someone's being shot, and you see their skeleton on the thing, and I could literally see that and feel smell my flesh burning but all of a sudden a hand hit me in the chest and knocked me back disconnecting me from the circuit of electricity that was going through my body wow and i fell into the furnace and i'm running up the stairs screaming to the third floor because that's where my my mom and dad and the rest of the family was and my mom met me at the top of the steps and she started screaming when she saw the burns marks on my face and my dad hit me to calm me down and took me to the hospital and my third degree burns on my face and the real miracle behind that is they wrapped my face and I looked like a mummy for a few days with my face wrapped. I went to service Bible study on a Wednesday and one of the assistant pastors at our church stood over me and began to pray and the church was praying and she poured a whole bottle of oil on my head as they were praying and wow. and um, because they said I was going to be scarred and have to go through skin drafts whatever take part of my leg or my hip and make my face over again or whatnot and um that next Thursday I had to go to the doctors and I'm sitting there in the office with my mom 
And the doctor said, do you really want to be here to see this? And my mom was like, yes, we've been praying. And um, and the doctor's like, this is going to be real horrific, and you might not be able And she was like, no, I want to be here. And she's holding my hand, and um, the doctor begins to unwrap the linen off my face, and he continues to unwrap, unwrap, unwrap. And the look on his face was like he was just in complete shock. And the nurses, they started crying, and my mom started crying, and I was like, what is wrong? And they showed me, and there was not a single scar, burn mark on my face. Wow. Now, this is third-degree burns and no scars. Third, completely burned. I mean, they had me scheduled for skin grafts and that I was going to, that was the only way, because the electricity traveled through my body. I sure. don't, it seemed like forever, however long it did, and I was still supposed to be connected to that electricity because I'm standing in a puddle of water, there was no one there, but mm. all I could see was this white shadow-like hand hit me in the chest, and I knew that had to be the hand of God wow. or one of my angels that separated me from that. And <laughs> the devil has been busy for my life, my whole life. That is incredible. And, um, yep. Wow. Friend, you're listening to Divine Intervention Radio. I'm your host, Daniel Fazina, and we are visiting with our special guest, Dale Wells. Uh, Dale has some amazing stories of how the Lord has worked in his life, obviously, uh, while being separated from the electricity by the hand of God or an angel. Now, Dale, I can actually relate to this because um, when I was in college, I worked as I worked in the film industry, uh, student films, and one of my first gigs out of college was as an assistant gaffer. And for anyone who doesn't know, a gaffer is an electrician on the set of a film shoot. And so I'm working with the gaffer, and I'm the assistant, and we're going into the basement of this house, and he's got to tie in all the, uh, the large film lights into the electric box of the house. And he hands me a wooden 2 by 4 and he says, all right, now stand there, and while I tie in the electric cords, your job is, if, if I get shocked, you have to smack me with the 2 by 4 and you know get me away from the electric box wow. and i'm like are you kidding me he's like no i really i really mean it if i get shocked you have to hit me and get me away from the box i was like wow so that was my first job out of college uh wow. <laughs> standing there with the two by four hoping and praying that nothing goes wrong and i wouldn't have to oh. whack this guy but uh yeah well that's just phenomenal and you know so you have the hand of god first of all separating you from the electric and then, not only that, but having your pastor and your family pray for you and not receiving any scars from third-degree burns on your face. That is amazing. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. And, you know, I'm sure you've had other instances as well, but the real main story that we want to focus on today is an incident that occurred, um, which was you were a victim of domestic violence and attempted murder, even that. Um, tell us what happened, you know, leading up to this traumatic incident that nearly took your life. Correct. I migrated from the north to the south and was living in Columbia, South Carolina. I've always been into restaurant management, 30 years plus of restaurant management and ownership experience. And at that time, I was managing a Waffle House and I was doing some hiring for some more staff. Anyway, this young lady came into my establishment, and I gave her an application, and she explained to me that she was working on her master's and just needed a part-time job to help her reach her goal that she was trying to acquire. And I was very taken by her personality, and there was just something about her, and I hired her and immediately told all of my staff that she was off limits. And I had set my attentions to her, which I knew was wrong, um, because as a manager, you can't interact with an employee that's below you. And So you had a romantic interest in her. Correct. Okay. Within a week, she moved into my house. Hmm. And I knew that cohabitating was definitely against God's will, and it played on my conscience, but I did it anyway. Okay. And um, in domestic violence situations, there's always signs. But it's how we react 
do the signs that determines the outcomes. In domestic violence, we make excuses for signs. Now, I'm not a small person, so she wouldn't physically put her hands on me. She would verbally and she would phys- personal property. And uh, early on, I purchased a pug. And I was so in love with my pug and training him and everything. <laughs> and I know they become like part of the family, right? Exactly. He was definitely part of the family. And I was going to work one day, and she said, no, I don't want you to go to work. I want you to stay here and be with me. And I'm like, you know I can't stay. I have to go to work. And she said, well, if you go to work, I'm going to kill your dog. Whoa. And I'm like, you know, when a person says something and you kind of think, are they serious? Is this true? Would they do something this dramatic? But I kind of believed her. And so, and I'd had Chubbs for about a year at that time. And I called an acquaintance who had two other pugs. And I called my job and said, I'm going to be a little late, but I'm coming to work. And I took Chubbs, crated him up, a lot of stuff, and drove about three miles to uh, the gentleman's home, sat there with Brian and Jennifer, and I said, you know, my girlfriend is threatening to kill Chubb because she always wants to be with me. She wants to be under me all the time. She comes to my job when I get to work. She stays the whole time, get off. And wow. At first, you know, I thought that was cute, and, oh, she just loves being around you. But then it got weird. I was like, wait a minute, crazy. And um, Brian looked at me and he said, Dale, are you sure you want to get rid of Chubbs? Maybe you ought to get rid of your girlfriend. In hindsight, I wish I'd have made that choice. But I was <laughs> doing everything I could do to appease her, to please her. But it was like me trying to put a Band-Aid over open heart surgery. Because that didn't solve the issue, me getting rid of Chubbs. She would just become more and more angry. I can remember just crazy things that she would say. We would was sitting on the couch one day watching a sporting event. Mm -hmm. And just out of the blue, she said, you know, I could take a bullet. And I was like, excuse me? She (laughs) said, yeah, I could take a bullet. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, I could swallow a bullet. Now, mind you, there wasn't a commercial or a show on that we were watching sports. We weren't watching something dealing with somebody killing themselves, anything like that. And I'm like, why would you say something like that? But then I got caught up in the conversation. She was like, well, people say it's a coward that kills themselves. This a person would really, and as I think about it, to pick up a gun and then point it at yourself and pull the trigger, knowing the damage that can happen, I guess in a way that would take some type of courage or whatnot. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't believe I was having this conversation with and I was like to myself, this is not normal. This is kind of crazy. But, <laughs> again, I dismissed it. It was just, you know, a conversation that happened. Love makes and, you blind, right? <laughs> yeah, it just makes you, makes you wonder. We were in Charleston, I remember, and, and she wanted to stop at this pawn shop. We went in, and we were looking in the jewelry department because I love to buy jewelry for her, but she wanted to do something for me. And I'm looking, and there's this really nice size neck, and it had a lock on it with diamonds around it. And the guy said it was like $10,000 for these two pieces with all the diamonds. And it was a lock, and it had a key to unlock the lock, and you gave the key to the person that supposedly had the key to your heart or whatnot. It was cute. I mean, but I was like, there's no way in my mind I'm going to get nothing like that. I'm spending that kind of money. And I want I want to get this for you. And she put it on my neck, and the guy was trying to ring it up and box it up, and I said, no, Denise, no, I'm not taking this. We're not getting this. And I took it off, and I put it on the counter, and the guy, you know, he was just happy for the sale. 
He already had her credit card. I was like, give her back the card. And I took the card out of his hand. You know, he ready to ring it and, and make his bonus or whatever. And I said, no. And so I walk out with the card. She gets in the car. And I hand her back the card. And I'm trying to drive on 95, trying to get back to Columbia. And she is cursing me. I'm talking about, I want to spend this kind of money on you. And this, and I'm like, look, you're still working on your master's. We got plenty of time for and all this other junk. And she's cursing. And I'm doing about 75 miles an hour, just a little bit over the speed limit, and <laughs> trying to get home as quick as I could. And she grabs the steering wheel and snatches the steering wheel. I hit the brake and block her with one arm. And the, the car comes to the medium, in the middle of the medium. And I'm like, what are you trying to do? You're trying to kill us. And I'm like to myself, wow. Maybe I should just let her buy the necklace. Uh, <laughs> and that kind of money to just make you feel like they're really trying to buy you and control you. Wow. And finally she calmed down a little bit. Now we were able to drive on home. She was still cursing and, and, and whatnot. But all of these are signs over the course of our relationship. Now I'm raised out of a mother and three beautiful sisters. And I wouldn't raise to put never put your hands on a female out of anger or or whatnot, and I right. never had done that in my life. But there's a lot of women that will take advantage of that when they have a good guy that knows not to put his hands on a woman, no matter what she does to them. Right. And um, it's still an uneasy and not a good situation to be in at all. Now, she, um, she had threatened you several times. She had destroyed your property. Correct. Uh, right. Well, January the 15th. Of 07, I came home, and she had destroyed a 32-inch flat-screen television, a bunch of personal property there in my home. And um, I was like, no, I can't take this anymore. Now, we had been together almost three years. Then I said, no, you got to go. I'm not going anywhere. She's cursing me, calling me everything in the book, every name she could call me, except the child of God. Mm. And she's just going off, and I called the police, and... The police come and see what she had did, and they agreed that she could either go to jail or go back to Brooklyn, New York. They made a judgment call, and uh, she looked at these two officers, and she said, you know what, I'm going to go back to Brooklyn, but I'm going to come back to Columbia, and I'm going to kill him, and I'm going to kill myself. And I'm like, officers, isn't this a threat on my life? And they were like, well, she's just angry because you're putting her out. Let her go back to New York and don't worry about it. They made that judgment call, and I wasn't upset about that judgment call. She went on back to New York. I get a phone call 24 hours later. She had called a bus back to Brooklyn. And she's like, I am so, so sorry for all the stuff I took. And you please, please forgive me. Can we still be friends? And I knew that she was going to be in New York, so I was like, okay. We can stay friends, so Mm -hmm. we would talk every day through January, February, and everything, you know, just quarter conversation. And then you got an unexpected birthday present, didn't you? Oh my goodness, March (laughs) the 15th. (laughs) All right, hold that thought. We're going to come back and hear the rest of this story. Uh, Friend, you're not going to want to miss this. You're listening to Divine Intervention Radio, and our special guest today is Dale Wells. Uh, He's got a tremendous story of God's amazing protection on his life. So stay with us. We'll be right back with more of Dale Wells right after the break on Divine Intervention Radio. You're listening to Divine Intervention with Daniel Fazina, and we'll return in just a moment. Times are tough, not getting easier, but there's an opportunity that could make a significant change in your financial situation. People are paying too much for home utilities, and everybody has them. Help friends and family save money and get paid for it. No obligation. You don't even have to talk to anyone unless you want to. Just listen to a three-minute recorded message. Call now, 715-GET-CASH. That's 715-GET-CASH. Listen, decide, and you could be on your way to a better tomorrow. 715-438-2274. That's 715-GET-CASH. Now 
Welcome back to Divine Intervention Radio. I'm your host, Daniel Fazina, and you are listening to the interview show that features intriguing people who've experienced the hand of God in amazing ways. Today's guest is certainly no exception. We are visiting with our special guest, Mr. Dale Wells, who has had many instances of divine intervention in his life. And he is talking about a specific one now that involves domestic violence. Dale, welcome back to the show. Thank you. No problem. So we were talking about your birthday, March 15th, 2007. You got a an unexpected birthday gift from your ex-girlfriend. Do tell. Correct. I um, got a phone call. Dale, come and see me. And I'm like, I can't leave my job here in Columbia and come to New York to see you. She said, it's your birthday. It's your birthday. Come and see me. I'm not in New York. I'm at this Motel 6 on Nunes Road. And I'm like, okay. It's my birthday. I haven't seen you in a minute. Yeah, I'll come and see you. And so as I drove up and pulled into the parking lot, phone rings, and she said, I'm on my way down. So she comes out, and she comes over to the driver's side door, and she leans in, and she kisses me on the cheek. And she said, you're the luckiest man in the whole world. And I'm like, what are you talking about? She said, you are the luckiest man in the whole world. I came here to kill you on your birthday and to kill myself. And I'm like, what are you saying that? Why are you saying that? She said, yeah, I came here to kill you. I said, stop playing. And she handed me a piece of paper from a pawn shop where she tried to purchase a 357 Magnum. Oh, boy. Now, she wasn't denied. She was delayed because she was in the military 20 years previous and had been discharged from the military, I didn't know. And that's another thing. We get involved in relationships not knowing the full backgrounds of the people we choose to be with. Right. And, you know, not know the skeletons or whatever they have in their closets or in, in their background. I'm looking at this piece of paper, and I'm like, wow, you are really, really serious about trying to hurt me. And I said, you know what? Take my number out your phone. I don't exist to you. You don't exist to me. Don't call me. I won't call you. We don't have to have anything at all to do with each other. And she shrugged her shoulders, and I started to pull off. She said, wait, can you do me a favor? Can you take me to the train station so I can go back to New York? What? And I said, you came here to kill me on my birthday, and now you <laughs> want me to take you to the train station downtown. I said, you need to get there best way you know how and as i she's got off, some uh some gall there <laughs> oh exactly my gosh. and as i pulled off the holy spirit said dale pick this woman up and take her to the train station if she is this bent on causing you danger she'll buy a gun from someone off the street and come through and do what she wants to do and so i tooted my horn i pulled around and i said look I she wasn't gone 25 30 seconds now i'm really watching her as she gets in the car and I'm looking, and I'm like, Denise, where's your luggage? Where's all the jewelry and stuff I bought you? Because she just had on a T-shirt and some jeans and some flip-flops. And she didn't have any baggage, just a little flimsy Nike bag. And I'm like, you came here from Brooklyn to Columbia. I said, where's your luggage? She looked at me, and she said, I wasn't planning on going back. I came here to kill you on your birthday. And to kill myself. Wow. <laughs> Unbelievable. The drive from that Motel 6 to the Amtrak station downtown Columbia was the longest, most deathly quiet ride I ever heard. Yeah, no and kidding. As I pulled into the train station, she leans over and tries to kiss me in the mouth. And I'm blocking. I'm like, wait a second. How does this work? You came here to kill me, but now you're trying to sell me affection. She shrugged her shoulder and she gets out and she goes in and she buys her ticket. I get out and I watch her get on the train. She tries to hug me and I kind of block it. I was like, no, that's okay. And I watched that train disappear as she was headed back to New York. And I'm driving home and I'm like, God, this woman is really trying to cause me danger. Hmm. But I dismissed it because she was on her way back to New York. 26 hours later, I get a phone call. Dale, I am so sorry for all of the drama I brought you through on your birthday. And the train ride has 
cleared my mind. I've released you. I wow. want you to be with whoever you want to be with. I'm going to be with whoever I want to be with. But can we still be friends? Oh, sure. You just tried to kill me. Not a problem. Right. I was like, <laughs> okay, because she was in New York. Right. So the end of March, we continue to talk. March, April is slow down. May, maybe twice that month I heard something. And then June the 19th of 07, I received a phone call about 6.10 in the afternoon. And it was Denise. And we talked for about 20, 25 minutes. Real cordial conversation. I'm thinking... Everything is good. She sounds great. She was asking me about what I was doing. I was in the process of purchasing a restaurant and how my golf game and everything was going. Just real cordial conversation. Mm-hmm. I hung up. I was like thinking to myself, she sounds like she's doing good in New York. Wow, she's moving on. That's great. So I'm in my kitchen getting my stuff together and my phone rings. What are you doing? And I'm like to myself, what am I doing? You're in New York. I'm in Columbia, and you're still questioning me about what I'm doing. But I just said, I'm taking out the trash. Mm. And the phone call went dead. I figured drop call. If she wants something, she'll call back. So I got my trash together, and I walk out my front door, and I walk down these two steps, and I heard Dale in a very distinct Brooklyn, New York accent. And I turned to the right. And I'm looking down the barrel of a 357. Oh, my gosh. I said, do you remember what I said I was going to do to you? Right then. So she was that, there. It was Denise. It was Denise. Mm. And right then my phone began to ring. And the ringtone on my phone was a song by Fred Hammond. And the song was No Weapon Formed Against You. And that song was playing. Wow. And I said, Denise, don't shoot me. And she said, if I can't have you... Nobody can. And the first bullet discharged, hit me in the dead center of the chest. The second one went through and shattered my left arm in three places. I fell to my stomach. She walked up on me and shot me twice in the back. Oh, my god! And she laid the barrel of the gun on the bridge of my neck. She pulled the trigger. It went through. I heard a neighbor screaming, stop shooting, stop shooting. You're hurting, you're going to kill him. And then I heard the gun go off, and I'm bracing for impact. And that impact never came. This guy grabbed me. I'm in a puddle of blood, and I'm barely able to speak, and blood is shooting out of my mouth like a water faucet. Oh, my gosh. And he's holding me. I'm like, what is she doing? What is she doing? Is she reloading? And he said, brother, you don't have to worry about her. She had placed a gun underneath her chin, pulled the trigger. They said her brains came out of her right ear and left eye came out of socket, and she collapsed, and she was laying on my feet dead. I was laying in a pool of blood, and I was like, Jesus, I'm your child. Help me. And we began to pray. And I was ambulance. I I gave him my mom's phone number. I said, call my mother and tell her. And we hung up. When I got to the hospital, I had less than half a cup of blood in my body. They had to pump me through the blood. And then they went through 15 different surgeries. They removed all of my left lung, part of my diaphragm, part of my small and large intestines, my liver, kidney, colon, spleen, gallbladder, all were hit, had to be repaired or removed. I was on a trach, a breathing machine, for 35 of the 40 days I was in the hospital. That's amazing, you know. Because you're, it's amazing that you're able to even speak after being shot five times, and a three fifty seven Magnum. For those who don't know, that is not a small caliber weapon. That is a no. powerful gun. Most definitely. I mean, did you actually feel the pain, or were you in shock, oh, or what happened? Oh, I felt when the first bullet hit me in the center of the chest. I, I, I mean, I felt and smelled the fire from the bullet and the burning of the flesh and I was in so much excruciating pain and it just seemed like the world and everything just slowed down and I was going through everything in slow motion and I felt the second impact and I fell and I felt the third in my back and then I felt the gun being placed at the bridge of my neck and I heard the bullet go off, and uh, 
Yeah, so I could feel it. And that is incredible. And there just thinking, God, where is this bullet that just brings me to your glory? That just takes me out of all of this. And it wasn't coming. And I wasn't seeing no white light and going to the light. And I wasn't seeing that. I was just like thinking, I have a daughter. I have a son that I still am responsible for. And these thoughts were going through my mind. I still want to be, I'm needed. I, I, I can't, I can't, I don't want to die. I can't die. Wow. That is incredible. Friend, you're listening to Divine Intervention Radio. I'm your host, Daniel Fazina, and uh, we've been visiting with our special guest, Dale Wells. And you're listening to his gripping account of being a victim of an attempted murder, being shot not once, but five times with a 357 Magnum revolver. I can't even imagine, you know, what that's like. I mean, Dale, you had to be in the hospital for how long were you there? Forty days. Forty days and forty, <laughs> forty days and forty nights. Kind of also a prophetic number, <laughs> like Noah and the exactly you know, and the flood. And so, what's going on, you know, in your mind as you're in the hospital and recovering? And you know, you must have been in shock at some point. I would. Yeah. Think. Uh, well, they kept me for the first m- week. And 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 induced coma and, and after they did all of these surgeries, they kept telling my family that there's nothing else that can be done, and that they can should go ahead and make arrangements and call people and and because they didn't see that there was no way my numbers and my liver that at one point they told my parents that if I would survive. I'd have to be on dialysis and carry a colostomy bag for the rest of my life. And do you have to do that? The God I serve said, not my son. Mm. I never had to have dialysis, and I never had to carry a colostomy bag. And I'm just so grateful through his grace and mercy that I'm here and that I'm able to share about what God has done for me. Wow. Now, I understand that... uh you know, this incident is obviously very traumatic. It changed your life in many different ways. Some, you know, obviously for the worse because of your physical conditions and limitations now, but also some for the better. And God did bring about blessing from it. I mean, obviously he spared you because you're here talking to us now. Uh, I understand you wear one of the bullets around your neck, one of the bullets that was in your body. You wear it as a uh, a memento for the occasion. Uh, But how has... You know, going through this and surviving it, how has it changed your life for the better? It's given me a voice. Um, I I travel the country sharing my testimony uh, about domestic violence. And domestic violence isn't a woman's issue. It's not a man's issue. It's a human issue. And the people that most suffer in a domestic violence relationship are the children that see this abuse. Right. Domestic violence breeds domestic violence. A child sees his mother being hit by her his her his her father or his father and then she goes to school and acts out those same behaviors and it becomes normal. Hmm. Uh son sees his dad being hit by his mom or vice versa. And he grows up doing the same thing, thinking that it's okay to do that. And I've been able to speak to many people in domestic violence situations and them being able to touch a bullet or touch my scars and then make the decision to get out to save their lives. In the state of South Carolina, we're ranked number one again for domestic violence and it's been that way for the past 16 years we've been in the top five in the country for domestic violence and so that means you have the most cases of domestic the violence most cases of wow. someone that says they love you but they end up killing you so someone that that you're supposed to be in love with taking your life mm, mm, and mm. that's a very very sad statistic i'm working with the attorney general's office and the Senate to try to get different laws changed. But the bottom line is you have to love yourself enough to say enough is enough. I'm not going to allow 
a person to verbally abuse you. There's many forms of abuse. Right. And when you allow any level of it, it becomes the level playing field. When you allow your boyfriend to slap you, or you allow your girlfriend to slap you when she gets angry, when he gets angry, and yeah, it hurts, and you go through whatever you're going to do, and then they apologize, and this, this, and this, then that becomes the level playing field. When you allow them to call you outside of your name, outside of what name your parents gave you, that becomes the level playing field. And it just progressively gets worse. Wow. We make excuses. Maybe it's something I said. Maybe it's something I did to make them feel this way or act this way. And, I mean, I did it in in and throughout the relationship that I had with her. Maybe it's, I said something. I did something. But that's and no excuse of, for them not, to abuse you, though. Exactly, for them to abuse you. And then you feel like, I deserve this. Well, they make you, because it's such a manipulative power, they make you believe that you can't have anyone else other than them, that I'm mm. doing you a favor, that you're not worth anything. You're not worth being happy. You're not worth being able to enjoy life. When you hear that door turn and your body cringes, it's like, oh, no, mm. home again. Wow. It's not a feeling you want to be in. No. And I was in that. I would, when I'd hear the creak of the brakes of that van pulling in, it was like, oh, here she come again. Instead of getting out of the situation, but we think that we can better the person, we can change that person. But if a person does not want to be changed or get help, you can't change them. Right. Only way they can be changed is through God, through Jesus Christ. Mm, right, and a lot of times we make that mistake of thinking we can change our partner or significant other and exactly. you're right you're, you're just setting yourself up for frustration there and for frustration and worse yeah i wouldn't wish this on anyone but across the country if there's so many cases of domestic violence and it's not talked about because there's a lot of abusers in prime positions and um they don't want to pass laws that's going to affect themselves hmm. Um, I, there's one thing I, I'll never forget, a law that was on the books here in South Carolina, that on Sunday at 12 o'clock, you could take your spouse to the state court and beat her from 12 to 12.30 with any object, as long as it wasn't thicker than your thumb. That's where you get the term, the rule of thumb. Right. A lot of people don't know that. I've heard of that. So, wow. You look it up in South Carolina law. That was the law that just came off the books a couple of years ago. Wow. That a, a man could take his spouse to the state house court and beat her with any object as long as it wasn't thicker than his thumb, the rule of thumb. That is Crazy incredible. laws like that being on the books and these <laughs> things that's going through people's minds that were possessions. And that's what a lot of people think just because you're in a relationship you don't own that person right that person doesn't own you you are still an individual now when you get married y'all become one in christ and being one in christ you're not gonna hurt yourself you're not gonna slap yourself or bite yourself or shoot yourself or cut yourself unless you really are just crazy but you want to treasure and cherish that person, right. and you need that in return. Right. So you got to love yourself enough to say enough is enough. My name is what your name is, not which with a B. Mm -hmm. It is you don't allow a person to verbally abuse you physically, emotionally. No, I, I hear you, and this Life is, is good too stuff. Short it makes for all of that. You know what you said about no one. You know, hits themselves or hurts themselves. It reminds me of the scripture that says pretty much just that. You know, no one hates his own body, but they love them. They care for their own body. They nurture their body. And it's the same thing with your spouse and your relationship with Christ. It's kind of a picture of, of God in the church or Christ in the church and, and marriage. And uh, hopefully we'll take that analogy to heart. Now, Dale, I have a question for you that's kind of been on my mind. But All right. you mentioned that when you came out of the house, 
the phone rang, and it was the song by Fred Hammond, uh, No Weapon Formed Against You Shall Prosper. That's taken, obviously, Correct. from the Word of God. I think it's Isaiah, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. But did you ever find out who actually called you at that moment? Yes, it was actually a, a worker that I had... She had left work early that day. We had gotten to uh, a little argument. It was just a slight argument um, about a certain way we were supposed to close uh, the kitchen down, and she didn't want to do something. And and I didn't really say anything harsh, but it wasn't a pleasant departure. Okay. And she was calling to apologize for that. Wow. Um, (laughs) And her name was Lisa, so shouts out to Lisa if she would ever hear this. And um, at night, she saw the story on the news and was just in tears. Mm. But when I came through, she said she was there the first day when I was in the hospital because she just felt like she just had to tell me she was sorry. Wow. And that always reminds me that there's power in the tongue. Life and death is in the tongue. Mm -hmm. And you have to always speak positive over your life, over your spouse, over your children, because you never know when your last day on this earth will be. And you hate to leave out saying something negative to your children, you know, cursing your spouse. and Oh, I hate you and because you're angry and you storm out and you get hit by a truck. Yeah. And the last words you told her or him was that you hated him. That is and, horrible. And yeah. that's on your mind mm. and on their mind. So you always, I mean, she felt she had to get in touch with me. And I didn't come to for seven days. And when I came to, my mom was there and she was there. Wow. And just <laughs> she had to hold my hand and say, I'm sorry for what I'm like. I wasn't even thinking about none of that. I couldn't talk at that point. I had to write it. But I wasn't even thinking about anything that petty. But it was just on her mind. And and that's always been a big reminder. Sure. Always kiss my spouse before I leave. When I leave. When I hang up the phone. Hey, baby, I love you. And it's not out of routine. And you say it because you want it to be positive. uh, Words that are coming out your mouth. Absolutely. That is amazing, and I'm so glad you told that part of the story because, you know, so often we we can tend to, you know, get angry at our spouse and, you know, say something we don't really mean and then leave, and God knows, I mean, God forbid, something could happen. I've heard stories of that happening. I think that's one of the reasons why the Lord commands us in 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 His Word. Say it says, "Do not let your do not let the sun go down on your wrath on your, or your wrath. anger." That's right. That's Never go to sleep angry. My wife and I try to make that a positive. You know, we try to live by that. And you know, right. if we have a little disagreement during the day, we want to apologize and and reconcile before the night is over and never leave in a huff or angry like that. Because, like you said, you never know. You could walk out you know, the door, and then five minutes later get hit by a truck. Today you're here, tomorrow you're gone. Exactly. And um, I'm just so glad that uh, not only that you were able to reconcile with Lisa, but also that she was, you know, and God uses all different situations for our good. That little argument that you guys had caused her to call at the exact moment that played a role in, you know, in this testimony. Of, exactly. Of hearing, no weapon formed against you shall against prosper. You. That is amazing. And I'm I'm really thrilled to hear, you know, that you've come through it. Um, you know, and I want to ask you, too, what did this incident do for your spiritual life, your walk with the Lord? Just more appreciative to His amazing grace, His amazing power. That's what God is all, what all about, and... and we say a lot of things, but then when it comes to walking in those things and having the faith to to do that, and it's all become so real, more real than you could ever, ever imagine. And if you're in a situation where someone is threatening, you're being hit, beat, or anything like that, you need to, again, love yourself enough 
Jesus took all the beatings from his abusers, and he died on the cross. That we don't have to bear any of those, any mm. of that. Your home is your safe place. Right. And if you can't have peace in your own home, where else can you have it? Mm-hmm. Amen. And that is so, so, so important. Sure. And God is so, I'm so grateful. I can't thank him enough. I, I don't complain. Yeah, I have, you know, some things that I want to, and just in the flesh, I'm like, wow, what if none of this would have happened? I would be, you know, but God allowed this to happen, and he spared my life to be able to be here with my wife and my family that I have here and to be the father and the husband that I know that I can be. I'm nowhere near perfect because I can't walk on water yet, um, but I'm <laughs> striving to to be the best that I can. That's wonderful to hear. Friend, again, you're listening to Divine Intervention Radio. I'm your host, Daniel Fazina, and our special guest today is Mr. Dale Wells. Uh, and unfortunately, we're running out of time, but just real quick, Dale, if there's someone listening right now who's struggling with the idea that they're not even sure if God is real or there for them, what would you like to say to them? That most definitely that God is real, and we're going to have to answer to him in the end. And that if you're in a situation, there's plenty of help. You just have to want the help. You just have to, like I said, say enough is enough. Because a lot of people, that's what it takes. You get sick and tired of being sick and tired, Mm. of being sick and tired. And then you need to, there's plenty of help. You could turn to God and just ask him into your life and lean on him follow any of the other agencies that are out there um, but it's going to save your life in the end and and you know it down in your heart you already know it you Uh already know it well amen to that i want to thank you mr dale wells for sharing your incredible testimony thank you so much for the work you're doing now working with uh domestic abuse victims, and speaking out and sharing your story. So just keep shining for Jesus. I appreciate you. Thank you very, very much, Daniel. It's a pleasure meeting you and having this opportunity to share All right. my story. Now, if someone wants to get a hold of you to invite you for a speaking engagement, how can they do that? My uh, email is dale.wells49 at yahoo.com. Dale.wells49 at yahoo.com and the number is 803-556-3641. 803-556-3641. All right, friend, you heard it there. Give Dale a call if you want to invite him to speak at your organization or church. And uh, unfortunately, we're out of time, and that about does it for this exciting episode of Divine Intervention Radio. I hope it has encouraged you and let you know that God is real, still working wonders among his people, protecting his people, and bringing good results out of an ugly situation. So thanks again for tuning in. God willing, we'll see you again next time on Divine Intervention Radio. You've been listening to Divine Intervention with your host, Daniel Fazina. You can email Daniel at divineintervention at mail.com. That's Divine Intervention at mail.com. All programs of Divine Intervention are available online at divineinterventionradio.com. That's divineinterventionradio.com. Join us next time here on Divine Intervention. Ah!